Welcome back to Pattern Recognition. So today we want to look a little more into modeling of decision boundaries and in particular we are interested what is happening with other distributions and we are also interested what is happening if we have equal dispersion or equal standard deviations in different distributions. So now we want to look into a special case and the special case with the Gaussian here is that we have a covariance matrix that is identical for both classes. And if we do so, we can see that the formulation that we found earlier in the previous video collapses in particular to a simplification of the matrix A. So matrix A was the quadratic part and this is simply a zero matrix now. This means essentially that the entire quadratic part cancels out because we are simply multiplying the one matrix with the inverse of the other matrix. They are identical, so they simply turn out to be zero. The nice thing here is that we can already see from the formulation that we find here that we essentially have a line that is separating now those two distributions and the line is essentially given by the difference between the two means and it's weighted by the inverse covariance matrix. And of course there is an offset and the offset is mainly dependent on the prior probability for the two classes. And this is weighted then by the difference of the two means multiplied by the inverse covariance matrix. Well, if we look at this example here, you can already see these are now two Gaussians and those two Gaussians have the same prior and they are distributed with the same covariance matrix. And if we have this case, our decision boundary collapses to a line. So this is simply the line as shown here. Again, if we would play with the priors, the line would move back and forth because this is altering the offset between the two classes. So if the conditionals are Gaussians and share the same covariance, the exponential function is affine in x and this then results in a line as decision boundary. The nice thing about this observation is that this result is also true for a more general function of probability density functions, so it's not just limited to Gaussians. And we do express this as equal dispersion. Generally, there is the exponential family of probability density functions and they can be written in the following canonical form. So this is some e to the power of theta, which is essentially the location parameter vector. And this is multiplied as an inner product with x. And then there is some function b of theta. And this is divided by the dispersion parameter and then we still add some c of x and the dispersion which is essentially then able to add some additional bias term on top here. So you see that this canonical form is implying several functions b, c and a and we're not defining the functions here right now but if we use this kind of parametrization, we can then see quite a few probability density functions can be expressed in the following way. So let's look into the exponential family. And of course, we find the Gaussian probability density function here. You've already seen that there is different ways of formulating the Gaussian. Here we all have 
diagonal covariance matrices and obviously there's also non-diagonal covariance matrices which then results in this rotation here as you can see so this is a very typical function that we're using to model the probability densities then we also have the exponential probability density function so you can see here that generally functions that can be expressed as lambda times e to the power of minus lambda x fall into this category and this kind of function is very interesting because these are exponential decays so these are probabilities for observing decays and are very commonly used for example in radioactivity the functions generally follow this kind of format but this is also true for any kind of exponential decay by the way also beer foam follows this decay rule so you can see if we vary the parameter you see that we can find different kinds of decay functions well not just the exponential probability density function follows the exponential family but also the binomial probability mass function that is given here as n choose k p to the power of k 1 minus p to the power of n minus k and you see these are repeated experiments so for example the coin toss that we talked about earlier so if we have the classical Bernoulli experiments or multi nulli experiments they will follow very similar probability mass functions and here you see different instances of the binomial probability mass function also the Poisson probability mass function follows this exponential family so here you see the Poisson probability mass function and we see different observations here and this is also a very important observation because this kind of probability mass function is highly relevant in particular for Poisson processes and if you have been working for example with particle physics x-rays photon counts and photon interaction you see that the Poisson probability mass function is essentially modeling x-ray generation also noteworthy is the hypergeometric probability mass function so with this one you can describe essentially urn experiments where you take out certain samples without replacement so this kind of function is able to describe probability experiments that are not using replacement and here are some examples so you see that these equal dispersion property is actually a quite general one and it holds for quite a few probability mass or probability density functions so if all class conditional densities are members of the same exponential family of probability density functions with equal dispersion the decision boundary f of x equals zero is linear in the components of x okay that's actually a pretty cool observation so what did we learn in the last couple of videos posteriors can be rewritten in terms of a logistic function we can give the decision boundary capital f of x and write it down with the posterior right away we can also find the decision boundary for normally distributed feature vectors and we've seen that this is always a quadratic function and if gaussians share the same covariances the decision boundary is always a linear function and this actually also holds for other distributions so actually a pretty interesting observation well this already brings us to the end and in the next video we want to look a bit more into the logistic function and in particular we want to look into ideas how to lift linear decision boundaries to more general 
applicability. So thank you very much for listening and looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.